Uh, thank you. Uh, so we've heard quite a bit about uncertainty in allometric models this morning, and um, I'll probably touch on a number of those uh, uh, topics through this presentation. Uh, primarily, though, I'll be talking about the uh, uncertainty to, uh, due to model selection. Um, also be presenting that in a little bit different context than what we've seen. Um, this will mostly be um, in regards to uh, actual implementation in the National Forest Inventory. Uh, so to start with, I guess I should point out that um, the National Forest Inventory in the U.S. is conducted by the Forest Inventory and Analysis Program, uh, also known as FIA. So if I ever um, say FIA, I am actually referring to the uh, National Forest Inventory. Um, it is a national program in the U.S., um, however, it is implemented regionally, and I'll just touch on that briefly as it um, does play into uh, uh, some of the concepts I'm going to talk about. Um, then I'm going to talk about an example from the northeastern U.S., um, basically talking about some of the early methods that we implemented. Uh, we transitioned to a nationally uh, consistent method uh, called the component ratio method, which is CRM. And then I want to talk about some comparisons of models. And then lastly, um, where we're going next, which is a, a national scale biomass study. So um, just briefly, this is how uh, FIA is... Uh, conducted across the country. There are four different regions. Um, there's the Pacific Northwest, which handles most of the um, West Coast states, um, Alaska, Hawaii, and a number of uh, Pacific Islands. Um, there is the uh, Interior West FIA, um, located in um, Ogden, Utah. And you can see they are responsible for many of the Interior Western states. Um, where I'm from, the Northern uh, Station is uh, the FIA headquarters is in St. Paul, Minnesota, and we have uh, the 24-state region that's shown in green. And lastly, the, um, the southern FIA unit uh, handles much of the uh, uh, southeast and mid-south um, states in the blue, um, as well as um, Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. So um, I was going to do a, a quick uh, historical overview of how things um, have progressed in the northeast. So uh, there were some biomass studies that were done there in the mid-70s, and then soon after that, we developed methods for reporting biomass in Maine. And um, all those methods are in um, Eric Wharton's 1985 publication. So we actually started reporting biomass um, from our um, NFI data uh, in the early 80s. And then, of course, once we had the state of Maine done, we wanted to progress to the other states. And so uh, work continued on that. Um, as, as described in Wharton and Griffith, 1993. And so basically we, we now have the ability to um, report biomass for all of the states. And we used those methods up until about 2008. And then um, there was a desire to have a consistent method across the country for FIA to uh, estimate biomass. Um, the under, basic underlying uh, uh, methods in the component ratio method is that um, you generate a, uh, a volume for the tree of, of the, uh, essentially the merchantable bowl, and then um, you convert that to biomass. So, so now you have biomass of the merchantable bowl, and then you can take um, the proportions from the Jenkins et al. publication and um, uh, develop the estimates of biomass in the other parts of the tree, such as the uh, tops and limbs and stump. So we currently use CRM for biomass, but there's been some concerns about how accurate it is. Uh, there's not much uh, analytical flexibility, and so now we've basically started on a national scale study. And so the primary uh, concept is to develop a consistent volume biomass carbon estimates for the various tree components. So now I'll uh, touch on the early methods a little more in detail, just to kind of set the stage here. So. Um, what I talked about where we started in Maine and then moved forward to other states was basically all done from three studies. And um, there was one study in New York um, done in 1979, another um, in West Virginia uh, that Harry Wyant and others published, and then um, uh, a publication by Young et al. in Maine in 1980. So 
our uh, equations were pulled from the literature from these three publications. Now, um, of course, we applied them across the entire Northeast, so we were extrapolating a little bit from, from where the uh, equations were actually developed in a geographic sense. And of course, as you would expect, three different studies, three different model forms, um, some using, one using no log transformation, one log log model, and uh, so, so there was no consistency among model forms, obviously, um, and all based on diameter. And so from those publications, we had 21 species covered, but of course we had many more than that in the inventory. And so we had to assign other species to an equation and we did that based on uh, similarities in dry weight densities. You know, basically from what we knew at the time that was published, uh, we, we assigned trees to, to equations. So the, the take home message is, is the early methods were just a combination of three independent small area studies. There were really no constraints or consistency across those models, those studies, and of course, of course, all the um, species that we would encounter in the entire inventory. So it kind of looked like that rock down there. It was just a big amalgamation of stuff um, all put together. But you know, there was the, the user's desired biomass estimates and that was the best we could come up with at the time. So that's what we did. So uh, I mentioned the component ratio method that we switched to in 2008. And what that is, is a consistent method. Now, um, I showed you those four regions um, earlier each one of those regions uses its own set of volume equations and, and those kinds of things. Um, so when you implement the component ratio method, you still have regional differences because the underlying basis is still in those regional volume equations. So even though once the method is similar, the basis of um, sound cubic volume, the immersion bowl, still has a bunch of regional variability. So if you go from uh, one region to another, they might use a different uh, volume equation for the same species and you'd get different numbers. And so uh, I mentioned earlier, basically we just convert volume to biomass and then we use component ratios to get tops, limbs, and stumps. And um, then you just add all those up and, and that's your total for the tree. So it's a little bit different than the um, previous Northeastern models that actually predicted the, the tree total. So uh, things never go smoothly, so you might expect that changing from the regional models to the CRM approach affected biomass estimates across the entire region. And probably the most notable difference we saw was for balsam fir in Maine, where uh, above ground biomass estimates dropped 18% when we switched from the regional models to the component ratio method. And so when you see changes like that, you start, people start to ask questions. Well, which one of those two methods is more accurate, or is either one of them accurate? And we kind of have to say, well, we don't know because we don't have any real empirical data to evaluate those models with. And so one thing you could do is to make yourself feel better is perhaps look at some other models and go, well, what other models that might be applicable to the region are close to our methods? And so, uh, you know, we could use the, um, the popular Jenkins equations, which were um, applicable to the entire U.S. And then um, uh, you know, our friends to the north, the Canadians, uh, published um, their models in 2005. And those were national equations as well. But if you look at their um, distribution of data, there's quite a bit um, in, in Quebec and Ontario. So reasonably close to the northeastern US. So we, you know, we could at least take a look at those. Um, and as that warning shows you, there's mass confusion ahead. So here are some analyses I did, um, just to uh, go over these graphs quickly here. Um, the um, y-axis is the percent difference. Um, this is DBH class in, in inches, um, one inch is two and a half centimeters, so that's about 30 cm's right there. And the lines depict um, the four different model types. So the US one is the um, Jenkins models, Northeast is the Northeast regional ones. Um, CR is component ratio, and the um, black line is the Canadians. Now, um, just for reference, I, uh, uh, to make this all relative, I made the Canadians the, uh, the basis. So they're always the flat black line on the, on the, um, in the middle there. And so um, I'll run through a few um, slides here. You can see there's two graphs, one for hardwood trees, one for softwood trees. And so uh, 
just to get started, I mean, basically what we see here for hardwoods is that Northeast predicted more than the other models. Um, the Jenkins models were slightly smaller, but you know, had a similar trend. You can see the component ratio method was quite a bit different in that um, predicted much less biomass for small trees than the other models. But then, of course, as trees got larger, it actually agreed quite well with the Jenkins equations. Now, if you go over to softwood, you see some similarities and some differences. Um, when we go over here, now the um, Jenkins models predict the most biomass, and the Northeast equations, um, you know, basically flip-flopped with Jenkins. Now they're smaller. And we see about the same trend for component ratio method. Um, very small for um, small trees and then coming up. But, you know, clearly over here, we, the component ratio method is much lower across the board than, than any of the other models. Um, this is a comparison for the dry biomass of the stump. So the graphs are all the same, but this is for stump biomass. And so you can, you know, without going through all the detail, you can see those relationships have all changed now. Um, you know, it used to be that the component ratio method predicted small values for small trees and then got bigger. Now it's going the other direction. Um, you can see the Northeast models predict very high hardwood stump biomass compared to the others. Uh, and again, jumping from hardwood to softwood species, now all those relationships change again. And um, so there's, there's not a lot of consistency here in trying to put together some sort of trend of uh, how models relate to each other. Uh, here again, um, this is the merchantable bowl dry biomass, um, same thing. Um, you can actually see some pretty good agreement here between the component ratio method and the uh, Jenkins equations. Um, generally the Canadian equations tended to pr predict lower than the rest of them. Um, northeast is still pretty high. Uh, if you jump to softwoods, very good agreement between the Canadians and the component ratio method. So it's just, it's, you know, it's all over the board by component, by um, species group. And lastly, I would just, you know, beat this dead horse one more time to show you, depending on the component you're interested, the models, uh, you just get lots of different uh, outcomes. And, um, you know, I think it was mentioned earlier, um, you know, you can easily get more than, than easily get 20 to 40 percent difference just by changing models. So where we see that in, in all the um, analyses that we did too. So basically what I showed is that whether you're predicting total biomass or component biomass, all these relationships that the different models show uh, are, are not consistent. Um, we saw a lot with the component ratio method that small trees that tended to predict small values, but sometimes you've got better agreement as tree sizes increase. Um, and just those four models, you know, they were doing all sorts of different things depending on, on the, um, the species group, what the components were, all those kinds of things. So it's really impossible to know which, if any of these models are accurate for a component, a tree size, a species group. And again, we just don't have any data to actually um, independently evaluate these models. So we know they're all different, but we don't know which one is best, if, if any. Um, just to touch on the model uncertainty um, a little bit, um, you know, uh, someone mentioned earlier this morning that a lot of times the publications don't include all the error statistics you'd like to see, and that's um, probably true with the northeastern models. And uh, you know, even if they were there, um, there's probably some things that weren't accounted for, like perhaps there was a lack of independence among observations and those kinds of things. Um, for the component ratio method, they're based in volume equations. A lot of our volume equations were fit to, to mean values from tables generated in the 40s and 50s by the Forest Service. Um, it uses wood density values to convert from volume to biomass, so there's uncertainty there that, we, that we're not sure of the magnitude of. Um, the Jenkins data um, was what they call a meta-analysis, but you know, essentially they fitted models to predicted values from other models, so almost Certainly that uncertainty is underestimated. And lastly, the, uh, the Canadian models, you know, there's actually a, a pretty good effort on the model fitting and the reporting of the uh, standard errors of the parameter estimates and the uh, root mean squared error and that kind of stuff. So there's actually some pretty good um, model uncertainty statistics in that publication. So um, going forward to the future, having seen where we are now, um, there's a number of knowledge gaps to be filled. Obviously we want to know about wood density, how does that vary? Um, 
it probably varies within tree for some species from the ground to the top and also perhaps even from the pith to the bark and then of course we want to know how does it vary spatially across the region um, you know perhaps it's not a constant from uh, the northeastern part of the region to the southwestern part of the region and of course how the biomass components are allocated within a tree probably varies across species, probably across tree sizes, and probably across geography. Uh, there's probably biomass to carbon and spatial variation. Right now we use uh, biomass times 0.5 equals carbon, so it's not very scientific. So it'd be much better to know, um, to know more about the biomass to carbon conversion. And of course we wanna um, you know, use modern statistical methods to uh, get good estimates of uh, how, the, how much uncertainty there is associated with our models. So we've engaged in this uh, national scale biomass study and basically the idea is to have compatible volume biomass and carbon estimates. Um, there's a number of uh, universities involved that are actually out um, cutting down trees and weighing them, um, cutting cookies out of the trees and taking them back to the lab and you know, drying them out and, and doing various lab analyses. Um, we also have some uh, industry representatives, um, uh, National Council of Air and Stream Improvement, Rainier, Potlatch, Warehouser, and we're currently uh, finishing up our second year of data collection. And we have about 500 trees sampled so far. Um, the other thing we're actively doing is um, going after some legacy data. In other words, data from other studies that's already been done that we can um, possibly uh, get our hands on and use. And uh, that's become pretty important. Uh, it was noted earlier that these kinds of studies are pretty expensive. So every tree you can get that's already been measured by somebody else can save you a substantial amount of money. Uh, in about a month from now, we'll have a workshop um, in the US to talk about um, the various modeling methods that we might employ. In other words, you could do a volume-based model that then converts to biomass to carbon, or, or perhaps you want to fit biomass models directly and then somehow go to volume and carbon from there. So there's a bunch of different approaches that um, uh, we need to talk about. So basically we need to identify the appropriate modeling and sampling approaches to, to develop the accurate and consistent uh, carbon estimates for individual trees, um, identify existing data, uh, and then when we see where those gaps are, we collect additional data um, using the sampling approaches that we've uh, identified in number one. And then lastly, of course, um, you know, fit the models using appropriate statistical techniques and uh, you know, take advantage of all the data that we can uh, possibly get our hands on. So uh, to summarize, uh, biomass prediction accuracy is questionable when the models arise from different studies of varying geographic extent. Uh, the between region differences due to the use of different models, different input variables uh, can, can be pretty large. Um, we also need to create more accuracy and consistency from a national perspective to, to generate credible carbon estimates. You know, when you see some of the graphs that I showed there, it's hard to convince people that your carbon estimates are, are reliable. And then lastly, of course, the national scale study can hopefully get us to where we want to be. You know, we'll have national consistency in definitions, model forms. Hopefully we'll understand how things vary across the landscape. Uh, but again, it takes a lot of time and money to get there. And that's it, thank you. Secretaría de Medio Ambiente y Recursos Naturales.